In my previous video, I've looked at the TCP IP model and the OSI model, and we've looked at the application layer. And in this video, we're going to look at the transport layer. So what can we say about the transport layer? First of all, the transport layer offers support for end-to-end -end services. This means that it supports the application layer above it by giving end-to-end -end support to those application layer services. When we're on the web and we're using our computer, or on the internet rather, we're doing lots of different things. We're visiting web pages using HTTP. We're sending email, SMTP. Well, those services, those programs, are needing end-to-end -end support or a channel to the host which they can communicate so that multiple conversations can go across the wire at the same time. So Transport Layer offers that and supports multiplexing, multiple conversations happening at the same time over the wire. How does it do that? It does that by having those services mapped to port numbers. So each service or each program maps to a specific port number logically on your computer. So when you're visiting the web, HTTP, you're using a web browser, you're connecting to the web server on port 80. Or if you're connecting to an FTP server, you're connecting to that server on port 21. If you're using DNS, port 53, mail, SMTP on port 25, and SSH connections, a secure shell connection, you're using port 22. Now, services that need reliability use TCP at the transport layer. Those services are HTTP, SMTP, FTP, SSH, Telnet, to name a few. Services that don't need reliability or need speed use UDP. And those are services like DNS, DHCP, voice over IP, streaming video conferences, things like that. They use UDP, which is a much leaner protocol, smaller footprint, faster, and TCP is reliable, but a little bit slower. When we send data over the network, the transport layer is responsible for breaking that data into pieces. Now, the pieces that the data is broken into are called segments, if it's TCP that we're using, and datagrams if it's UDP. So this is where we have, we're sending the data across the internet. This is where that data is broken up into separate pieces. Each piece is given destination and source addressing at layers two and three. So the pieces can reach their destination and then return. Think of it like this, you have a message and it's uh, lines of in a letter, and you cut each line in the letter into a piece or a strip. You put each of those strips into an envelope. Well, if you want to send that letter now, you've got to send, let's say, 100 pieces, because each line has text on it. Well, you've got 100 envelopes now. Well, each envelope is going to need addressing, right? An address, a name, a city, a zip code. So each piece is given destination and source addressing, but that's at layers two and three. That's at layers at the, um, the internet layer and at the link layer. At the transport layer, which is what we're talking about, each piece is given a destination and source port number, and that's at layer four, the transport layer. Layer four in the OSI model, transport layer in the TCP IP protocol suite. So each conversation or service can be identified. So if it's a web page, port 80. If it's an FTP session, port 21. So each conversation or service has its own port number. That's how we can multiplex multiple conversations across the internet or across the network at the same time. So now let's talk about servers. Servers listen and reply using port numbers. And here are some examples. A web server is listening on port 80. A DNS server is listening on port 53. A Telnet server is listening on port 23. So the whole point here is that the servers are listening and they're going to reply using the port number. Now the clients connect and receive using port numbers also. So it's not just the server that's using the port numbers, but clients too. So how does that work? 
Well, the servers typically are using well-known port numbers. Not always, but sometimes they're using well-known port numbers like these ones. And the clients are using random port numbers. So for instance, client web browser connects using an HTTP GET request. Here is the packet right here. That's my little envelope right here. This is the packet. The server is listening on port 80. So you can see here the arrows going this way. Server's listening on port 80. The client web browser's connecting. So the destination port number is 80 because we're going to the web server on port 80. The source port number is 22, let's say 132, which is a random port number. It's a random number, randomly generated. This identifies the host computer. Now, when the server replies with an HTTP reply, we're going the other way now. It's going back to the client web browser who's ready to receive the HTTP reply. The port numbers are switched. Now, the source port, the source is port 80 because it's coming from a web server, and the destination port is 22132. So the ports get switched as the packet is being sent and then and then coming back those port numbers are switched so now let's look at TCP the transport control protocol what can we say about TCP well first of all we've said it before it's reliable how is it reliable it uses sequence numbers so every packet is numbered it uses acknowledgments or acts as they're called an acknowledgment is just the next sequence number that needs to be sent. So we've got sequence numbers, we've got acknowledgments, which is the next sequence number. We also use a thing, a process called selective acknowledgments or SACs, and this enables the process to be more efficient. TCP also uses flow control, the ability to speed up the transmission if things are going well, or if there's some congestion or things aren't going well, we could slow down how much data is being sent across. That's done through the window size, which is how many bytes can be sent, how many segments can be sent at one time before we need an acknowledgement. And the TCP, one of the main reasons that TCP is reliable, or one of the main things or characteristics that makes it reliable, is that TCP will retransmit lost packets. So if packets get lost en route, then they can be retransmitted. Another characteristic of TCP is it's connection oriented. To start the conversation, to send a web page or to request a web page and then have that web page sent back, it starts with a three way handshake. So it's a connection oriented protocol. Before we start sending data, and exchanging data, we use a three-way handshake to start the session. TCP is a slow and reliable protocol because of all of these things. As such, the TCP protocol has many settings. It's got header fields and flags, has a number of items inside of the protocol header that helps give it that reliability. Namely, the sequence numbers, the acknowledgments, the window size, all of that. TCP uses source and destination ports to identify a service and a host, and we've already said that. So a port number for the service, whether it's HTTP or HTTPS or SSH, and a random port number to identify the host. So let's look closer at that TCP three-way handshake. The three-way handshake look, works like this. You have a client that wants to connect to the server. So the client initiates the process by sending a SYN segment, or a SYN packet, if you will. So that SYN is the synchronization segment, and its relative sequence number is zero. Now actually, that sequence number is a randomly generated number to start the sequence, but like in Wireshark, Wireshark will by default, make that sequence number a zero so that relatively you know this is the start of the sequence. However, in reality, it's a uh, randomly generated number. So a SYN packet starts the three-way handshake, sequence number, relative number zero. The server responds with an acknowledgement, and that number zero is incremented by one. So the ACK that returns is an ACK one. Or whatever that real number is, incremented by one. 
The server also sends its own SYN or synchronization uh, segment with its own sequence number set to an initiating number of, in this case, zero relatively. And the client responds with an acknowledgement and increments that number by one, so in this case, AC1. So you basically have a SYN, what we call a SYN and an AC, or SYN and an AC and an AC. So a synchronization, an acknowledgement, and its own SYN, and then an AC. And that is a three-way handshake. Now to end a conversation, you have two two-way handshakes to end the transmission. The client sends a fin and an acknowledgement, probably from the previous sequences or segments that were sent, and the server responds with an acknowledgement of this fin packet or this fin segment, and then sends its own fin segment. And then the client responds with an ACK. So it's two two-way handshakes. All right, let's talk about, that's the, that's the TCP protocol. What about the UDP protocol, the user datagram protocol? What can we say about UDP? Well, it's unlike TCP. So if TCP is reliable, UDP is unreliable. How so? No sequence numbers, no acknowledgments, no window. No, uh, no flow control, no window size, none of that. It doesn't retransmit lost data. It's connectionless. There's no three-way handshake. It's faster than TCP, but not reliable. The header is smaller with fewer fields, a lot smaller. It also, though, it does use source and destination port numbers, just like TCP, to identify the service and the host computer. So it still uses source and port, destination port numbers to, to identify those pieces, the server and the host, or the service, rather, and the host. However, it doesn't, it's not, it's used for protocols that don't need that reliability. Things like streaming video, where if you're missing a few uh, packets or you're missing a little data, it doesn't matter, you need to keep moving because you want to keep up with the next piece of the video or the next piece of the audio so on and so forth. All right, let's look at closer at these port numbers. So the port numbers work like this. The well-known port numbers are 1 to 1023. In those 1023 port numbers, you have services like these protocols here. The ephemeral ports are the registered ports, which are 1024 to 49,151, and the dynamic ports, which are 49,152 to 65,536. So the registered ports, these port numbers can be registered for servers that need to be uh, available over the internet that companies wanna make available, whether it's a game server or something like that. Those, these port numbers can be registered or rented yearly from ICANN for consumer services. And then the dynamic port numbers are dynamically assigned ephemeral port numbers.